look, to really understand what's going on with benzodiazepines nowadays with protracted withdrawals and benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction, it does help to take a little time to approach this historically. In the next few videos, all of this will be more clear than ever for everybody. So let's get started with this small historical approach. I'm Dr. Beat, and let's get started with this question. The history of benzodiazepines, how they came into play, and the issues with them, whether it's the acute withdrawal, the dependence, the addiction, and dealing with what's nowadays called at times protracted withdrawals. But then there's a new term put together by academics, fine, benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. So let's go back to the beginning. In the 50s, we didn't really have benzodiazepines. We had barbiturates. Barbiturates work great. The only problem with them is, again, there's the abuse and dependence liability, but more concerning and important for everybody is the fact that barbiturates have a narrow therapeutic index. And essentially what that means is the dose from treatment where you get the effect that you want in relation to the dose of overdose, over sedation, stopping breathing, is very narrow. And whether it was in situations of abuse or misuse, whether it was in situations of mixing the stuff with alcohol, whether it was intentional, overdose was easy and is easy with barbiturates. To this day, barbiturates are out there. You can prescribe them. And in certain situations, I take advantage of their efficacy and utilize them short term. But at that time, there was no benzodiazepines and barbiturates were the main player in the game and they had this significant issue related to them. Come around in the 50s and we'll skip another medication that's not a benzodiazepine, but the first benzodiazepine marketed in the 50s was Librium. And again, this is a long-acting benzodiazepine. And the idea with Librium was the fact that it doesn't have that narrow therapeutic index that barbiturates do. And, you know, for the most part, it was marketed as such with all of the positives and safety profile of Librium. Well, within a year, it was, I think, the best or the most drug sold in the United States or the best selling drug in the United States. And well, within a year, it was the most, uh, it was the number one sold prescription medication in the United States. I'm going to tell you right now, that should always be a clue that something's off. And within one to two years after that, the truth of the matter is they were fully aware of the problems with Librium in the sense that there was withdrawals, acute withdrawals. They could still have seizures if it was serious enough or if they were on a high enough dose for a long enough period of time. And I'm going to tell you that they were aware of the fact that some people were having trouble coming off of this that had been on it long-term. None of this was really made public or or, or, or disclose in a way where people knew about it. You go, eventually, you have Valium. And I think that was in the 70s where Valium presented itself. And, you know, it's still a long-acting, relatively. Benzo, it's nothing like Librium. And that became the most sold, number one prescription sold drug in the United States. And shortly after that, again, the same problems were noted with Valium. And, you know, the indications for these were generalized anxiety and eventually panic and insomnia and so forth. And it was really within one year where physical dependence and withdrawal issues were noted, including people having a difficult time coming off of this medication. The argument is oftentimes made that these issues were often overlooked and bypass 
simply because of the fact of the huge value of the fact that it was not as easy to overdose on these medications versus barbiturates. So it was worth it. I think there's other factors involved here, obviously marketing, but I think there's one more factor which I'm going to mention in the end here in defense of the physicians that were prescribing these medications. So you have volume and in the next 10, 15 years, 80s, 90s, you start to get what is sometimes called second generation benzodiazepines. These are a lot more potent and these include Xanax and Clonopin. At the same time, in the SSRI started to be introduced, introduced for depression. There's an interesting twist here because in that marketing, and eventually there was FDA indications that they were able to obtain. Once they obtained those in the marketing for the SSRI, somehow SSRIs started being used to treat anxiety. Xanax, interestingly, was being used, marketed to treat depression or as a mood stabilizer. Keep in mind, before the SSRIs, there was nothing else. And Xanax was being pushed at that. So somehow in this fog of marketing, market demands, consumer needs, hype, these two indications were sort of mixed. And, you know, there was this kind of depression, anxiety syndrome, which is really no longer used and is separated out. But that's kind of what was happening in this stew. And that sort of increased the market curve for Xanax to be used for depression as well. What's interesting is all this time, there was data accumulating that this stuff has problems with dependence, addiction, severe withdrawals, acute withdrawals, but also long-term problems. And probably one of the first papers was Ashton. I think it was in 1984, where she described these issues depending on the dose, how long a person was on it, and their general state that there were some people that were really having a hard time coming off of this stuff. Um, and then we go through the 90s, and this stuff is selling like hotcakes all around. And just recently, just recently, is starting to be recognized that there is a problem for a subset of the population in coming off of benzodiazepines long term. Now, it's been termed oftentimes protracted withdrawals, and that term has historical utility and significance. The researchers that put together the term bind benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction have been very clear that the idea is to throw in the constellation of issues that people on long-term benzodiazepines and trying to taper off of it have. And the point here is not to call it protracted withdrawals because there's a lot to tease out here. They very clearly state we don't know the mechanism and what it actually is. This is important because is this continued withdrawals in the same way original acute withdrawals are? And it's pretty much well established that this is a de novo new set of symptoms that people are experiencing. So you can't really call it withdrawals. The problem I have with the term that we're using now, even though the researchers did a wonderful job that are saying it's benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. And that doesn't mean much, but it does the job. Unfortunately, I think in the public, they're looking at this as benzodiazepine causes brain damage for that subset of a population. And this is of no benefit to anyone because you can't really say much more than the fact that benzodiazepines triggered 
whatever that is going on and long-term chronic issues of being trying to come off of the medication. And I even argue, and you will see this in the next few videos where I lay all of this out and you're going to be more educated than ever on this benzodiazepine issue. You know, I think it should be psychotropic induced neurological dysfunction. And up to now, I've used the term myself that I've coined psychotropic hypersensitive because the truth of the matter is it looks like there's this nervous system for that individual person. It's like a whole bunch of dry wood ready to be kindled and set on fire. And anything can induce this constellation of bizarre symptoms and hypersensitivity to somatic issues. It could be antidepressants. It could be marijuana. It could be other drugs. So I think the researchers have done a really great job and, you know, really made sure that we're not labeling, calling, defining much, except very little to define that there's a set of really difficult symptoms to manage here when people are trying to get off of benzodiazepines. But I think the public and a lot of online forums have taken this to heart. And I, I don't necessarily believe that there's absolutely no evidence for me to think there's permanent brain damage or loss of tissue, even though there's some studies that show a smaller brain, but those studies have limitations. And again, in further videos, I'll get into it. So here we are, and now we've recognized that there is an issue if you're on benzodiazepines too long. And we've known this. And I, I argue that it's clear that it was known at least as far back as the 80s. The argument originally from the marketing part for the pharmaceuticals was that it's okay, let's move forward because this is better than barbiturates because of the narrow therapeutic index of a barbiturate. Maybe so. And the world of pharmaceuticals and their marketing is a dark, bizarre world, and one has to approach it carefully. But I'm going to add something else. Today, we have to understand that uh, you know, you know, the, the FDA has finally put warnings on benzodiazepines that these are for short-term use. And this is really pushed. But I don't think this should apply to any patient except a patient that is going to be on benzodiazepines for the first time and has never been on them before. But I don't think this new sort of much more strongly mandated indication of benzodiazepines are to be used only short term applies to every patient because benzodiazepine are not just for anxiety or panic attacks. They're often used for issues that have to do with spasticity uh, uh, and a lot of musculoskeletal issues because remember benzodiazepines are muscle relaxants. Those patients would really suffer if you took their benzodiazepines away. Number two, there's a group of patients that would fall under typical psychiatry issues. And some of those patients have been on benzodiazepines long-term to stabilize whatever issue they had. And you can't just pull those guys off of it. And number three, even the ones that are just dealing with general anxiety or panic attacks that have been on it long term need to truly understand the risks and benefits of ripping yourself off of the benzo because you think the benzo is doing brain damage versus staying on it, staying on the lowest dose possible and the stuff being managed by a physician. I'm going to get into all of that in future videos, but the main point here is we're at this point, benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction is a good term. It's a correct term. I think it's being misinterpreted by the public out there and people that have been on benzos, and they're putting themselves in withdrawal state 
that becomes an inflamed, hyper-excited situation, and they cause more damage that is more difficult and takes longer time to reverse. I hope that helps and starts to couch this issue in a more digestible perspective. And this was a brief historical account. In the next few videos, I'm going to come at this from every angle and throw in the SSRI issue because that issue looks exactly like benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. So should it be called benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and look below in the description for opportunities for coaching calls with me. See you guys next time. Peace.